Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to today's session. Uh, so this is the 20th lecture of uh, UPSC CSC series on environment and ecology. We have so far completed a lot of portions here. I hope you have watched those videos. If you haven't, all those are still available in my channel. Please go back and watch them. You know, uh, where whichever you, whichever ones you want. Okay, each of that each class deals with a particular topic. So even if there is no, you know, uh, you can skip some videos and watch from in between also. It doesn't affect the flow or anything. Okay, so anyway, we are uh, reaching the you know final portions of the environment and ecology. There will be maybe uh, three more classes by the year, and we will finish this. Okay, uh, maybe uh, like two three days. That's that's it, uh, and we would be uh, winding up the environment portions as well. But anyway, let's to, uh, start today's session. Uh, once again, I welcome all of you to Madhav Singer classes. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please do so. Also, make sure to like this video and share with your friends. Okay. So today's topic is agriculture, a very relevant topic. Most of the questions that, asked, uh, that are asked from agriculture are based on government schemes. So please do look into that. There are plenty of government schemes that get, you know, there are, which are already existing. We have looked through some of them in previous lessons. And, uh, you know, during budget and all the government also, you know, usually comes up with new schemes. So please do learn about those also. Okay. Or I know towards the end, uh, you know, uh, last or last couple of months towards the exam, uh, most of the academies online comes up with compilations based on government schemes and all. Download any one of them and go through the government schemes in very clear, you know, pretty much detailed way. Okay, but the static portions I will be covering today. All right, so let's begin this session, agriculture. So what exactly is agriculture? Uh, it's a very general term. We have all heard about it. Agriculture is usually a term used to encompass all the aspects of crop production, correct? Livestock, farming, fisheries, forestry. It's not just, you know, related to farming and, you know, uh, certain particular farm crops. No, it's a huge term, it's an umbrella term that is used to cover, you know, all kinds of uh, activities such as cropping, farm, livestock farming, fisheries, forestry. Okay, and there are certain, you know, plenty of subcategories of agriculture which deals with a particular crop or a particular item. Some of them are given in this first slide, you know, to go through them very quickly, silviculture. What is silviculture? The art of cultivating forest trees. It's known as silviculture. Sericulture. Sericulture usually deals with silk. Okay. Cultivation or rearing of silkworms. It's known as sericulture. That's something that we all have heard about. Then you have apiculture or apiculture. Basically, that deals with honey. Okay. Honey bees and all. Then olericulture is the science of vegetable growing, dealing with the culture of non woody plants for food. Olary culture. You can use all these terms in your main sensor writing also to make it more impressive. So please do have some idea what this all deals with. Then we have viticulture that deals with grapes. Okay, when you uh, when you study Mediterranean climate in geography, you might have come across this term viticulture. Basically, that deals with grapes. Floriculture, anything that deals with ornamental flowers, okay, or ornamental plants. Arboriculture. Arboriculture is the cultivation, management and study of individual trees, shrubs, vines and other perennial woody plants. Clear. Perennial woody plants. It's known as arboriculture. Pomology. Pomology basically deals with study of, as, you know, study, uh, transport and production of fruits. Okay. And then aeroponics. What is aeroponics? Aeroponics is the process of growing plants in an air or mist environment. Usually you have to have some medium to grow a plant, correct? You have to plant it, you know, in a soil or maybe put it in water, something like that. But in aeroponics, none of these, these are necessary. Basically, the plant can grow in air. Okay, or maybe a misty kind of environment. Then hydroponics. Hydroponics is basically growing a plant in the water. Make the water nutritious in, and, you know, there is no need for soil. You can see that in houses and all, in house gardens and all, 
you can see examples you know uh, where people take a bottle and fill it up with water add some nutrients into it and put the plant in there the plant can grow in water no need of soil it's known as hydroponics then geoponic geoponic means normal growing you can plant the uh, you know uh, seed in soil and it grows as such the usual practice okay so these are some associated terms with agriculture so if you did not know any of them please do uh, try to remember as many as possible you know maybe you can get something from this okay now scope and importance of agriculture okay what is this i mean we all know what is agriculture but what is its scope or why is it important as far as india is concerned 17.2 percent of our gdp is contributed by agriculture okay agriculture and allied sectors actually contributes food 17.2 two percentage of our GDP, which is, you know, almost up to one fifth of our entire gross domestic product. Correct. And India being a hugely, uh, you know, uh, primary sector country, agriculture provides livelihood to about two thirds of our population. Agriculture is a very important topic, especially considering our the farmer protests that have been happening in New Delhi, which is very recently ended after government you know made several promises uh, relating to the farm loss and all okay so please do study about this particular area in depth also please do look into what that protest was all about what was that farm bill what were the new laws okay and government had to finally agree to repeal all of them all right so please do look into all that if you already do not know that agriculture also provides about 57 56.7 percentage uh, you know, employment of the entire workforce of India. Or in another way, we can say that agriculture is the single largest private sector occupation. Okay, agriculture is not government regulated or anything. It's, you know, based, it's a private sector job. Okay, so it's the single largest private sector occupation in India. Agriculture uh, accounts for about 14.7 percentage of the total exports. It also provides raw materials, correct? We have, you know, uh, as, as far as the Indian industries are concerned, most of the raw materials are supplied by the agriculture sector. Then, food security and eventually the national security. Allied sectors such as horticulture, animal husbandry, dairy, fisheries, all these are again very much contributing to economy, health and family welfare, correct? Uh, employment, etc., etc. So overall, although agriculture is one particular sector, because the Indian population is highly dependent on that, it has huge implications on the India in its entirety. Okay, economy, society, uh, the culture, okay, food security, national security, everything is keenly connected with agriculture. But Indian agriculture faces a lot of problems. Okay, it's not, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, smooth running apparatus. There are huge issues with Indian agriculture. What are the major issues? First of all, fragmentation. Most of our lands are fragmented. Okay, we do not have huge agricultural farms. Even if you have it, eventually when you pass, pass it down to you know, your generations, it becomes fragmented. Correct. Uh, when the father passes the uh, property to his sons and daughters, what will happen? You know that property is divided among several people correct so then walls will get built in between and it will be separated and you know the the land goes on becoming more and more fragmented this is a huge bane as far as agriculture is concerned why because as the farmland becomes smaller and smaller investment also gets reduced if you have a huge farmland it is okay to invest in high high-end machineries and all Correct, because you can earn it back. But if the farmland is pretty much small, then you won't invest too much into it. Because even if you, I mean, I mean it will end up as a you know loss. You can't invest in very high cost machineries and all if your farmland is pretty small. Correct, because the yield will be small anyway. Even if you, even, you know, it's very good uh, you know, uh, harvest. Okay, so fragmentation of land holding. This is a major issue. Existence of small and marginal farmers, another issue. Instead of farmers having huge farmlands and all, we mostly, most of the Indian farmers are 
either small or marginal farmers because the amount of land they have is you know something like two hectares or you know less than that two acres or less than that regional variation india being a highly diverse country even in terms of topography correct okay? india's geography is highly variant you know that south india has nothing to do with north india as far as uh, the geographic patterns are concerned same goes for west same goes for east even within a particular region consider one state the north of that state is hugely different from the south of that state which is different again from its west which is different from its east correct based on soil based on climates based on micro weather based on a huge lot of you know factors india is so diverse and this is again not such a happy news for agriculture because you can't initiate a common policy as far as indian agriculture is concerned based on the crop based on the climate based on the topography etc etc you have to have specific packages for specific things okay then dependence on seasonal rainfall indian agriculture is heavily dependent upon monsoon if the monsoon i know varies in in either way if it is too much or if it is too low in either cases it severely affects agriculture we have seen flooding we have seen droughts we have had the both you no know, we have had both of these extremes in india correct so indian agriculture is highly rain dependent so to some extent the government has tried to resolve this problem by creating uh, you know proper irrigation structures but it is not up to the uh, required level there are plenty of areas in india which are yet to be covered by irrigation structures low productivity of the land yes indo gangetic valley is highly productive but the western parts of india have semi arid or arid climate and the land is not that much productive there are areas where the you know uh, despite the land having nutrients due to soil erosion leaching etc etc the land has lost its productivity you know already know about what is the topography and what is the type of soil uh, the a tropical country has correct india has abundance of different you know kinds of soil for example in the deccan region we have black soil which is very good for cotton cultivation but that soil is not good for a wide variety of other crops because of its you know you know acidic content etc uh, etc et same goes for set, uh, red soil laterite soil alluvial soil each of them has its own properties which supports specific types of crops correct but in general uh, we have comparatively a lower productivity then increasing of disguised unemployment what is disguised unemployment this is very important point guys if you do not know what is disguised unemployment please do study uh, your economics portions okay uh, there is a topic called unemployment in economics uh, so when you study that you can study what is disguised unemployment but to put it in layman's terms uh, consider that there is a farm okay say there is a farm and 10 people are working in this farm okay and this they, they are producing say uh, x amount of crops x the yield is x all right this is the maximum yield possible from this land okay now another five people are being added more people are coming into this working in the same farm so in effect now instead of 10 people there are 15 people who are employed correct so it's good correct i mean you have five more people who have a job now that's pretty much good but the problem is the yield remains same doesn't matter how many people are working it might be 10 it might be 15 but the output is x only which means this added five people are doing nothing there is no contribution of them in the output correct earlier when it was 10 also the output was x when it became 15 also output is still x so that extra five people are basically doing nothing this is known as disguised unemployment this is a severe issue in indian agriculture especially because a lot of people from cities having other or no worked at other kinds of jobs like industry it sector etc etc they have you not know, done away with all that and they are all entering the field of agriculture and the agricultural sector in india is becoming highly saturated and this saturation is what is causing disguised unemployment okay now disorder in marketing of agricultural products yes another issue agricultural products i mean just you know uh, it 
how you market it is it's also very very important you have you know various kinds of systems like the dry chain cold chain etc etc also when you uh, when you have to export something you have to meet certain standards and qualities correct export quality is different from your domestic common quality otherwise certain countries will not accept that goods we have had scenarios like that in the past also so the way you market it is also highly important and marketing deals with a lot of things it's not just about the crop it's about how you process it how you store it how you transport it how you package it correct so that is another issue and finally weak land reformation we need proper you know laws regarding land how you know about its handling etc etc right now it's a mess okay we need proper land reformation we have to have uh, proper policies proper laws etc etc while dealing with this sector so appropriately measures has to be taken so these are the main issues with indian agriculture the problems based or uh, you know uh, faced by indian agriculture okay now crops and its classifications what are the different kinds of crops and how are they classified they can be classified based on a wide variety of things we will be touching into some of the important ones first of all classification based on climate okay so based on the climatic condition crops can be classified as tropical or temperate you already know what tropical and temperate are i have explained it in the previous class or if you have studied geography you would know this what is tropical basically in very layman's terms uh, those crops which are grown in warm and hot climate they are known as tropical crops basically that you know what a tropical climate is correct there are certain specific factors that make a climate uh, tropical basically it's something you know closer to the equator region correct so warm and hot climate this is what the term tropical means so crops such as rice sugarcane jowar are examples of this second one second one is temperate crops which uh, which are well adapted to very cool climate you know wheat oats gram potato these are the examples so within india itself we can see both okay south india we have tropical kind of crops towards north india we can see a uh, temperate kind of crops all right now classification based on growing season this is a very important classification i request all of you to study this thing very well okay so based on the growing season crops can be classified into three first one kharif kharif crops are also known as rainy crops or monsoon crops okay so these are grown in monsoon months so when do we have monsoon in india mostly from june to october november time correct i mean the southwest monsoon mostly from june to october november that's the time so those crops that are grown during this period are known as kharif crops so naturally they require a warm wet weather and uh, they are very you know one of the major cropping uh, seasons in india and also uh, required short day length for flowering it's a small season that range from june to october november period and the crops that are grown here is uh cotton rice jowar bajra those crops that needs a lot of water uh you know and uh high temperature okay so these are known as kharif crops so in upsc exam usually the questions come in such a way that uh, you will be given four crops and you will be asked to choose which of them are kharif crops or say which of them are rabi crops something like that okay so please do study uh, which crops belong to which season this is a very important classification as far as prelims are concerned second one rabi rabi crops are also known as winter crops or cold season crops so naturally think about those crops which are grown in a cold climate when is the cold climate in india somewhere around between october and march i mean properly it is between december and february but we can start from uh, october to march that is the period for rabi crops so these crops include wheat gram sunflower etc last one zaid zaid crops are also known as summer crops okay so they are actually grown in the summer months summer months means the remaining from march to june okay so june to october or november we have the rainy season 
Then October to March, we have the cold season and from March to June, that's a full year. Okay. So these are the three cropping seasons. So in the Zaid crops, we have groundnuts, watermelon, pumpkins, gourds. Think about it. During summer season, what do you eat or drink? You can see lots of, you know, street vendors selling watermelon and all, correct? So it's the time when these kinds of crops are grown. Clear. So these are the classifications based on growing seasons. Now, based on the crop duration, uh, sorry, life of the crops or duration of the crops. Seasonal crops. What are they? A crop completes its life cycle in one season. Such crops are known as seasonal crops. For example, rice. You can sow the rice, then it will grow. Uh, after that, you harvest. So that is the one, that's one entire season. So within one season, its life cycle is completed. That that particular you know rice plant it does not you know regrow or you know uh, reflower again in, during the next season. No, that's not how it happens. You saw it, you uh, you know grow it and you harvest it. Done. Then you have to sow new seeds again. Correct? Or does it you know uh, grow from the previous year's uh, remains? No. Okay. So such crops are known as seasonal crops. Second one, two season crops. What are they? Crops complete its life cycle in two seasons. Example, cotton, turmeric, ginger. Okay, now annual crops. Crops require one full year to complete its life cycle. Example, sugarcane. You have to, you know, when you when a sugarcane is planted, uh, till the time it's harvested, you have, it's a full year. Okay, it doesn't, you can't plant it today and harvest it next month. No, it takes a whole full year to, you know, properly grow up and, uh, uh, the time of harvesting is only after 12 months. Then biennial crops. Crops require two years to complete its life cycle. Banana, papaya, these are the examples. Perennial crops. Crops live for several years. Mango, guava. You have seen mango trees, correct? It's there. I mean, it won't give you mangoes every other day. There is a particular season in which it, you can get mangoes from it. But the next year, in the same season, the same period you can again get mangoes it will flower and it will give you the fruit again for a long time you won't have any fruit from it but when the season arrives then next year also the same thing continues so this goes on for several years such crops are known as perennial crops now these are the classification based on life of crops classifications based on cultural method or water okay first one rain fed Second one, irrigated crops. So then as the name suggests, cultivation of crops mainly based on the availability of rainwater. Such crops are known as rain-fed crops. Example, jowar, bajra, moong, etc. As far as irrigated crops are concerned, the water source is the irrigation facility. Any kind of irrigation, canal irrigation, river, trickle drip irrigation, whatever it is. Okay, so those crops that are, you know, much based on rain is known as rain fed crop and those crop that is based on uh, uh, it is some other kind of irrigation or some other kind of water source is known as irrigated crops all right now based on the root system we have studied the different kinds of roots of a plant in uh, one of the previous classes i hope you remember so the most broader method of uh, differentiating the types of roots are tap roots and fiber roots Correct? Tap roots and fiber roots. So here also the classification is based on this. Tap root system. The main root goes deep into the soil. Example, cotton, chur, grape, etc. etc. Then fiber root. The crop source roots are fibrous, shallow and spreading into the soil. It does not have a system that goes deeper, but instead it spreads horizontally, a lateral kind of growth. Okay, so these are the types of crops which are based on root system classification based on economic importance cash crops and food crops so cash crops are again you know based uh, targeted for commercial purposes earn more money example sugarcane cotton correct because it has an industry associated with it as far as cotton is concerned you have the entire cotton textile sector which is a huge income generator similarly as far as sugarcane is concerned you have the sugar industry Correct. The bagasse or the leftovers of the uh, you know, sugarcane can be used for ethanol making. 
ethanol blending and all which is again associated with the oil industry so all these are cash crops indigo was another cash crop that which the britishers forced the indians to cultivate and i hope you remember about the indigo revolution and all uh, i had taken all that in the history series so if you haven't watched it please go back and watch that it will be useful for your examination now food crops food crops are those crops which are grown for the purpose of food okay food not just for the human beings but also for the cattle okay it can be food for the human beings or the fodder for cattle example jowar wheat rice etc etc now classification based on the number of cotyledons what are cotyledons i hope you remember your biology classes uh, in your high school okay you the seeds are of two types with there are monocots and there are dicots correct so if you have only you know the one structure one full thing it's a monocot if you have two segregations it's a dicot it's based on how the seeds are okay so monocots are you know having one cotyledon in a seed example uh, all the cereals millets etc etc then dicots uh, crops having two cotyledons in the seed example all legumes pulses almost all trees okay now classification based on the length of photo period required for floral initiation most plants are influenced by the relative length of day and night correct i mean there are certain plants which require a lot of sunlight there are other plants which require shades okay there are plants which actually favor shades rather than direct sunlight okay all kinds of plants are there but in general most of them are related with intensity of light the plant growth is related to intensity of light correct so when does it flower how long will it flower okay all these are based on the length of day and night all right and this effect on a plant is known as photoperiodism okay so this relation to day and night it's known as photoperiodism okay so that based on this they can be divided into short day plants flower initiation takes place when days are short less than 10 hours for example you know rice jowar uh, green gram black gram etc then you have long day plants requires longer days and you know more than 10 hours flow uh, floral initiation like you know wheat barley etc etc then you have day neutral plants doesn't matter photopere does not have too much influence on such plants either way it grows okay so these are the classifications based on the length of the photopere or photoperiodism so that is all about the different kinds of classifications on crops based on several factors now let's look into some associated terms with agriculture starting with tillage what is tillage you have heard about tillage uh, you know I, i am pretty sure that you have heard about this term uh, you have a basic understanding of what tillage is but we are going to look at it in a bit more depth okay so basically the mechanical manipulation of soil is known as tillage it can be you know plow or some uh, you know other kinds of machineries whatever it is any kind of mechanical manipulation of soil for obtaining ideal conditions for plant growth is known as tillage okay so what exactly is tilth tilth is a term that is associated with tillage tilth is nothing but the physical condition of the soil obtained out of tillage okay when you plow a soil or you know when you conduct some sort of tillage whatever is the end product whatever is the condition of the soil at the end of tillage it's known as tilth okay it can be coarse tilth it can be fine tilth or moderate tilth coarse tilth means the particles the sand particles will be you know like you know uh, it's it won't be as fine as it should get it could be you know uh, more of a conglomerate kind of thing it will be coarser in fine tilth the tillage is much much more you know sophisticated or it's much much more thorough with thereby the render, rendering the soil particles as you know uh, fine as possible moderate is somewhere in between all right now types of tillage here also we have plenty of types starting with on season tillage what is on season tillage it's based on the time when the tillage is happening tillage operations are you know uh, done for raising crops in the same season or at the onset of the crop season 
such tillage is known as on season tillage so if you want to say uh, uh, cultivate a particular uh, plant in a particular season and you are tilling during that season itself or at the beginning of that season such tillage are known as on season tillage you are basically conducting the tillage in the same season in which the plant is supposed to be grown it's done together okay so such a tillage is known as on season tillage preparatory tillage this refers to tillage operations that are done to prepare the field for raising crops okay basically this is again a general term uh in order to raise a particular crop you have you know sometimes you till you sometimes you do not till if you are tilling for you know making the ground prepared for the plant growth such a tillage is known as preparatory tillage uh, it basically you know uh, increases the amount of topsoil it basically uh, you know loosens up the soil enabling the root to grow deeper uh it gives the soil uh, you know uh, much more capacity for holding water etc etc okay now primary tillage okay this comes under types of preparatory tillage primary tillage primary tillage means what the tillage operations that is done after the harvest of crop to bring the land under cultivation is known as primary tillage okay so basically this is done after the harvest of a crop to bring the land under cultivation this is the first time okay you harvested a crop and then you have to you know sow or prepare the land for the next season correct or the next cropping so for that before that you have to till the land so that tillage is known as primary tillage then secondary tillage secondary tillage comes after primary tillage you can do that operation once again to make the uh, tillage much more finer okay uh, it helps to clean up the soil it helps to break uh, the uh, clots and all okay it also helps to incorporate more manure fertilizers etc etc for this purpose harrowing and planking etc are done these operations are done in order to make the land much more uh, you know uh, thorough uh, with secondary tillage then dry tillage again this is very much associated with the term itself what is dry tillage basically that deals with dry land okay tillage associated with dry land conditions are known as dry tillage wet or puddling tillage again this is again just uh, think about the name itself those kinds of tillage that is associated that are associated with stagnant water for example rice you have seen how rice is grown correct you need a stagnated water area so there also you can you have to till the land such tillage are known as puddling tillage or wet tillage now off season tillage what is off season tillage on season means what at the beginning of the season or during that season of that cropping season itself the tillage is also conducted so what would be off season tillage tillage operations are done for conditioning the soil suitably for the forthcoming main crop season uh, is known as off season tillage so before that season begins okay so uh, suppose you have to uh, you know you are planning to grow a particular plant x and uh, this it it season it's a kharif crop example okay so the tillage is done during some other season say during rabi season or uh, zaid season such kind of tillage is known as off season tillage a tillage where uh, you know uh, basically you uh, till the land during the off season that's all it could be of the following four types post harvest tillage summer tillage winter tillage or fallow tillage okay these are the different types of off season tillage now some more terms associated with tillage subsoiling i know that this slide is a bit congested uh, but i will upload this in my telegram channel you can read it from there okay for now i am explaining it so you can listen to it if you can't read it so subsoiling what is subsoiling to break the hard pan beneath the plow layer special tillage operations like chiseling are performed to reduce compaction such a practice is known as subsoil so now it's nothing it's basically uh, you know when you plow the soil okay the top soil is very easy to plow the topmost portion it's very easy it's already loose in sand so the plow will go deeper and also you can easily manipulate that soil but as you move deeper and deeper the soil becomes more and more compact correct it will become more and more difficult to 
you know, push through your axe or say uh, plow. Correct. So the subsoiling technique basically loosens up the harder pans of soil. That's it. Clear. So specific operations are necessary for this, such as chiseling using axe or something. So the advantage of this is more soil will become loosened. So you will have a greater volume of soil to work with. Excess water may percolate downward. Also correct. If the soil is too compact or too, you know, uh, too much of a hard pan, what will happen? The water will not percolate. It will act as an impermeable surface. Okay. Or a partially permeable surface. surface. This will cause the water to, you know, erode away. Or it will flow away rather than going down and replenishing the uh, natural water table. Correct. So subsoiling helps in, uh, you know, making sure that more water goes into the water tip, underground water tip. Reduce runoff and soil erosion, obviously. Roots of crop plants can penetrate deeper, another advantage. If the soil is very hard, it, the plants might find it very difficult to penetrate. And there is a very good chance that the plant won't survive. But, the, yeah, but if the soil is loosened enough, then it can penetrate deeper and you know it can reach the underground water tables. So beneficial for the plant. That is subsoil tillage. Then you have clean tillage. What is clean tillage? It refers to working of the soil of the entire field in such a way. No living plant is left undisturbed. It's known as clean tillage. Complete eradication of uh, any living plant. Everything is tilled. Why would you do that? In order to destroy weeds, pathogens, pests, etc. etc. Every inch of that soil is disturbed. Okay, uh, the blade goes everywhere. So all kinds of weeds and you know other voluntary uh, unwanted plants, soil bone pathogens, pests, all are done with. Such a tillage is known as clean tillage. Now blind tillage. What is blind tillage? It refers to tillage done after seeding or planting the crop in sterile soil, either at the pre-emergent stage of the crop plant or while they are in the early stages of growth so that the crop plants do not get damaged. But extra plants and broad leaf uh, weeds are uprooted. Okay, so you may have seen this, especially uh, uh, you know, in major farmlands and all. Uh, you, know, you, you just put the seeds and all. Or maybe the plant would have come up you know, in a very small manner. But a lot of weeds and all, you know, huge uh, weeds and all would have grown adjacent to it, etc, etc. So in this case, blind tillage is conducted whereby all these already grown major plants are destroyed. And the minor, you know, uh, the, the, our target plant is un left undisturbed. So the weeds, etc, etc are done with, but our, the, uh, the plant that we intended to grow, that is preserved. Okay. So such a tillage is known as blind tillage, then zero tillage. Okay, There's, this is a practice whereby no tillage is done. No need to till the soil. This is also good for some of the plants. Okay, What are the advantages or what are the disadvantages of zero tillage? Basically, in zero tillage, the new crop is planted in the residues of the previous crop without any prior soil tillage. So after one harvest, whatever is left, whatever the residues are left are kept in the farm itself. No additional plowing is done. And then you, you know, put the new plant or you know, plant the new seeds over that without any kind of tilling operations on the soil. So such a method is known as zero tillage. Okay, so naturally this cannot happen without proper uh, conditions, correct? So you would, I mean, from all the things that we have read so far, tillage basically helps to increase the top soil cover. It helps to, uh, you know, loosen up the soil. It helps to uh, destroy any impermeable soil formation such that, so that the water can percolate downwards. The roots can grow downwards. Correct. It can uh, prevent uh, weeds from growing. Pests and other kind of pathogens can be destroyed. So in zero tillage, there is no tillage. So all these above mentioned things could happen in zero tillage. Correct? Herbicide, uh, so you know the uh, unwanted plants will grow. 
uh, it will it, the plant root will find it difficult to grow downwards correct the nutrition etc etc how uh, how much would it be or how much would it have to be added all these are in a disarray so naturally in order to you know, control all these things in order to regulate all these things you have to have alternative mechanisms so in order to prevent weeds you have to use herbicides in order to prevent pests you have to use pesticides so all these extra things have to be added into the soil in the case of zero tillage okay so the advantage advantages of zero tillage are that zero till soils are homogeneous in structure with more number of earthworms yes that's true when you actually till the soil it affects everything it does not affect the you know bad things alone earthworms which are you know who are friends of farmers they also come under the axe under the blade a lot of them are killed during the process correct so that is actually bad for agriculture so in zero tillage case earthworms are left unaffected so they can do their job it's good for them similarly organic matter content increases yes in zero tillage cases, usually the leftovers of the previous crops are kept in the soil. For example, mulching. Okay, mulching is a process whereby the crop residues are kept, you know, left alone in the field itself so that it will turn into humus and, uh, you know, it will decompose in that area and the soil can absorb the nutrients. Okay, so same thing happens here. Surface runoff is reduced due to presence of mulch. Yes, just as I mentioned, because we you know allow the residue to be there itself a lot of water can also be conserved in that area itself otherwise what will happen there is a very good chance that the water might run off from the topsoil level itself and you know it flows into adjacent drainage systems so these are the advantages of zero tillage but as much as it have advantages there are some obvious disadvantages also what are they higher amount of nitrogen has to be added yes you have to have more fertilizers, extra artificial fertilizers, etc. etc. Because you are using the same soil. The topsoil level is or the topsoil layer is constant. You are not bringing up extra soil or anything. You are not plowing it. You are not aerating the soil. Correct. So you have to have artificial nutrients much more than other kinds of cropping. Perennial weeds may be a problem. Yeah. Either you deal with the weeds using huge amount of pesticides, uh, herbicides or you have to go for tillage. So in zero tillage cases, you have to either suffer through the weeds or use more herbicides. Then high number of volunteer plants and pests, same thing. Volunteer plants means what? Unwanted plants which are not, not intended to be grown, but they grow anyway. Okay, then pests also. You have to use pesticides, otherwise, you know, because of the lack of tillage, the pests will continue to grow. Okay, now cropping. Tillage is done. This is another topic, cropping. What are the different types of cropping and what are the associated terms with cropping? First of all, crop intensity. What is crop intensity? Usually, what, what is intensity? Intensity is something related to percentage. Correct. So, the number of crops cultivated in a piece of land per annum, per year, is known as crop intensity. The number of crops cultivated in a piece of land per annum okay so for example in certain states this is very high but such as Punjab, Tamil Nadu etc etc the cropping in the crop intensity is as much as 140 to 150 percentage the in, you know it's it's highly dense but in certain areas which are arid or semi-arid such as Rajasthan cropping intensity is pretty low why because that land is not as much productive as in Tamil Nadu or Punjab Clear. So crop intensity has a lot to do with the productivity of the land also, the fertility of the land also. Okay. Now multiple cropping. What is multiple cropping? All of you know this. Growing more than two crops in a piece of land in a year in an orderly succession. It's known as multiple cropping. It's also called as intensive crop. So maybe from January to June, you will grow one crop and then June to December, you would grow another crop or maybe again, a third crop uh, during some point of time. So in succession, you will grow more than one type of crop and this repeats every year so such a practice is known as multiple cropping double cropping what is double cropping two crops per year in sequence okay multiple means more than two 
Double means two. Then what is monoculture? Repetitive growing of the same salt crop in the same land. It is known as monoculture. Mono means what? One. So grow that same crop again and again in the same piece of land. That's known as monoculture. Monocropping. What is it? Continuous production of one and the same crop year after year or season after season. It's known as monocropping. All these are very rudimentary. You can easily understand it from the name itself. Soul cropping. Another type. Again, what is soul cropping? One crop variety grown alone in a pure strand at normal density. It's known as soul cropping. Sequential cropping. What could it be? Think of it. Sequential. So it has to have at least two different things. Correct. It, and it has to happen in a series fashion, in a sequential fashion. So growing two or more crops in sequence on the same field is known as sequential cropping. Okay. Not together, but one after another. Relay cropping. What is relay cropping? Growing the succeeding crop when previous crop attained its maturity stage or sowing of the next crop immediately before the harvest of the standing crop. So relay means what? If say one particular crop is uh, being sown in January and it goes all the way to uh, May. Okay. Jan to May. Example. Okay. And uh, if you are actually planting the new crop in May going all the way to say August, it's known as succession or it's, an, it's known as sequence cropping. But if there is another crop where you can start somewhere in April, okay, during the harvest season of the previous crop, you start in April and then you go to say uh, August or say July. Okay, so there is some portion which is coinciding. Such a cropping pattern is known as relay cropping. All right, now, Ratoon cropping. What is ratoon cropping? Raising a crop with regrowth coming out of the roots or stalks of the harvested crop. It's known as ratoon crop. So uh, in certain cases, although after even after harvesting, the roots are left intact in the soil. The new plant will grow from those roots. Or maybe in some, some cases from the shoot portion itself, some stalks will sprout, which, you know, becomes the new crop. Such type of type of cropping is known as ratoon cropping. You do not have to sow fresh seeds every season, but from the root itself or the, from the uh, sprouts itself, it you know uh, continuously regrows and goes on like that. Clear. It's known as ratooning or ratoon cropping. Then you have intercropping. What is intercropping? Growing two or more crops simultaneously with distinct row arrangement on the same field is known as intercropping. Okay, so in one row you can grow crop X, in another row you can grow Y, then again X, then again Y. So, you know, like in a row wise or in a column wise, X and Y, two crops are, two or more crops are grown like that. It's known as intercropping. Intercropping has huge advantages. What are they? First of all, better use of growth resources, including light, nutrients, water, etc, etc. Rather than growing one particular kind of crop, you can actually grow multiple kind of crops, correct? So maybe you can add a you know, leguminous plant as one of these crops. So this leguminous crop, uh, crop can actually fix the nitrogen back into the soil, thereby increasing the nutrient uh, quality of the soil, while the other crop can use it, correct? So by simultaneously growing two crops, you are actually maximizing the productivity of the land. Such a method is known as, uh, so uh, it's known as intercropping and this is one advantage. Then suppression of weeds. Yeah. Weeds affect a particular kind of plant. Correct. So if you can grow two crops, one, one maybe, uh, you know, uh, uh, one which is affected by that weed, the other could actually be a repellent of that weed. Okay. Each plant has its own characteristics. Correct. So there could be one plant which can actually be a, act as a weed repellent. Then yield and stability. Even if one crop fails due to some unforeseen situations, the other could survive possibly. Correct. Then successful intercropping gives higher equivalent yields. Yes. Higher cropping intensity also. Reduced pests and disease in, uh, incidences. Again, the same thing. One plant would, would be, you know, resistant against that pest or against that disease. 
while the other one may not be. So that plant which is resistant to all these could act as a barrier to prevent that pest or that disease from uh, spreading too much. Then improvement of the soil health and ag uh, agro ecosystems. Think about it. Using uh, these kinds of, you know, this uh, technique of intercropping, you can, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, you can plant leguminous crops or you can plant something like that, which could actually increase the fertility of the soil. So basically, the soil health is improved. So these are the major benefits of intercropping. And this is one of the favored methods of agriculture. Now, types of intercropping. What are the different types of intercropping? First one, strip intercropping. I know that this is too much information for you. You might have already gotten saturated. Don't worry about it. Try to have some idea of whatever is being uh, taught today. Later on, you can download this and revise. And at that time, you know, everything would stick to your brain. Okay. So what are the types of intercropping? First one, strip intercropping. So growing of two or more crops simultaneously in strips, wide enough to permit independent cultivation, but narrow enough for the crops to interact with each other. It's known as strip crop intercropping. Basically, you are growing two or more crops in uh, strips simultaneously. These would have some sort of interaction, helping each other or you know, some sort of interaction. But both of them can grow independently without harming each other. Such a method is known as strip intercropping. You can use it for groundnut and red grub. Then parallel cropping, just as the name suggests, growing of the two crops simultaneously, which have different growth habits and no competition among themselves. Okay, no relationship between each other, no competition, which means neither can harm each other. Such a method is known as parallel cropping. Example, black gram with maize, soya bean with cotton, etc, etc. Nothing common between either of those, so naturally no competition. Synergistic cropping. Yields of both crops are higher than of their pure crops on unit area. Example, sugarcane and potato. Okay, so the thing is, if you plant sugarcane, okay, suppose that in a sugarcane field, uh, its yield is say 80%. Pure sugarcane, nothing else. And there is another field of potatoes, again, independent field. The yield is say, for example, 70%. -ish. Okay, but... If you can intercrop sugarcane and potato, the yield of both of them will increase. Sugarcane will become 85. Example, okay, not realistic numbers. Example. And uh, potato could become, say, 75. So by intercropping, the yields of both of them are increasing. This is known as synergistic intercropping. Okay. Now, multi-story cropping. What is it? Basically, just as the name suggests, you are growing at different heights. Okay, so example, coconut, pepper, uh, cocoa, pineapple. Think about this. Coconut trees are long. Uh, you know, they are very high, correct? So uh, you can grow pepper along with it. Pepper trees are, you know, like shrubs. They are, they have some height, but not that much high as a coconut tree. Then cocoa plants, smaller, but again, it's at a different level. Then pineapple, very low, uh, different level. So it's like a canopy. Okay, so such a method is known as multi-story crop. Relay intercropping. What is relay intercropping? I already explained what is relay cropping in the previous slide. Same thing. In an intercropping fashion, that's all. Ally cropping or alley cropping. What is alley cropping? System in which food crops are grown in alleys formed by hedgerows of trees and shrubs. So, uh, say there could be a, you know, a row of trees. Okay, and there could or a, another row of shrubs or trees or whatever so between that there is some space so there's a hedge you know uh, there's a valley or an alley okay where if you grow crops there it's known as alley crop the tree layer uh, this on the both sides act as hedges and the in between space this is known as alley so if you grow crops there it's known as alley cropping okay it's another type of intercrop now Mixed cropping. What is mixed cropping? Growing of two or more crops simultaneously intermingled without row arrangement is known as mixed cropping. So if you have row arrangement, it is known as intercropping. But without any kind of 
specific arrangement. It is known as mixed cropping here and there. The objective is to meet the family requirement of cereals, pulses, vegetables, etc. etc. Basically, it is a subsistence farming. Okay, so if uh, if you have a plot of land, say small plant, a small area, 10 cents. Okay, so in that area itself, you are growing 10 different types of crops. So you do not have enough space to arrange them in a, a sequential order, any kind of particular order. So you plant wherever you get space. Correct. So such a method is known as intercropping, usually used for subsistence farming, not for commercial purposes. Okay, example, shogam, uh, bajra, kaupi, etc, etc. Sustainable agriculture, another associated term, very much important uh, for your exam. Uh, please do look into this. Also, look into the sustainable development goals of United Nations. Okay, so what is sustainable agriculture? In layman's term, it is a form of agriculture aimed at meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising or without endangering the resource base for the future generations. Okay, so basically you have to, I mean the current generation have to meet its needs without endangering the needs of the future. So keeping the future generations in mind, we are using the resources and not exploiting the resources. Such a method of agriculture is known as sustainable agriculture. So this uh, deals with a lot of things. It uses manure, uh, crop rotation practices, minimal tillage, uh, and with minimum dependence on synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, antibiotics, etc, etc. So you are achieving your needs without any kind of exploitation. Okay. Now prevent land degradation and soil erosion. This is one advantage. Uh, if you over exploit that land, it will cause land degradation. The land will lose its uh, productive capacity and it will become barren. Correct. So uh, sustainable agriculture uh, basically conserves or preserves the soil productivity. Replenish nutrients and control weeds, pests and diseases through biological and cultural methods. So that is it. Uh, this is a holistic term. Okay. Sustainable agriculture. Basically, it's an umbrella term that deals with any kind of productive activity in agricultural field that basically achieves our intention without compromising the needs of future. Okay. Now, organic farming. Organic farming is another term which is always in the news. Uh, please do look into the current affairs related with organic farming, which is the first state in India to become completely uh, into organic farming. That particular state got an award and all. I hope you know it. Do look into it. Which state in India has maximum land area covered under organic farming? Okay, all these things, are, these are all different. So go find it yourself. I am not uh, telling you everything. So what is organic farming? Organic farming avoids or largely excludes the use of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and growth regulators and livestock feed additives. So without using any kind of synthetic things, you are purely going with natural farming techniques. It's known as organic farming. Okay, so it naturally relies upon a lot of natural uh, productive things. Example, crop rotation, crop residue, animal manure, legumes, green manure, on and off farm organic wastes, mechanical cultivation, mineral bearing rocks and aspects of biological control of pests and diseases to maintain soil productivity and tilth to supply plant nutrients. So, Look, in that entire paragraph, which which is like three or four lines, there is nothing synthetic. Everything that you feed into the soil is basically natural. Correct? Even in case of, uh, say, uh, manure, uh, uh, fertilizer or manure, whatever it is, it's all natural. It's animal manure. You are not using synthetic fertilizers. You are using mechanical cultivation, but that does not mean you are adding anything into the soil. You are basically plowing the soil and making the most of the topsoil. That's it. Okay. So these kinds of, uh, this kind of uh, farming is known as organic farming. It helps in maintaining the stability of natural ecosystem. Yes. Building up of biological soil fertility. Yes. I mean, basically you are not exploiting the soil too much. Correct. If you add, add, add more and more and more fertilizers into the soil, what will happen? 
it will cause bioaccumulation biomagnification leaching uh, you know etc etc correct and it will form you know uh, convert an oligotropic lake into eutropic lake you have studied all that basically it will degrade the soil so organic farming can relieve the soil of all these kinds of stresses and protect the soil against all these kind of issues control of pests diseases and weeds through development of an ecological balance within the system yes you are not using anything artificial or uh, you know etc here you are you, you are actually building a system a natural system that can give you the best value you are using biological agents you are using uh, very good uh, natural techniques you are using you know good methods sustainable methods rather than uh, chemical fertilizers and you know, all other you know uh, exploitative things okay so organic farming recycles all waste and manure within the farm that's also there cow dung or say leftover of the previous harvest all these are actually put back into the soil all these things will be you know decompose in the soil and will add back to the nutrition nutrient capacity of that soil rather than adding chemical fertilizers okay so you can you do not have to have an alternate waste management mechanism because the waste will act as the fertilizer for the next season and organic farming makes the most of all these things okay so there are basically three interrelated principles here mixed farming crop rotation and organic cycle optimization all these things are self explanatory i have already explained all of them in the previous slides then another associated term is eco farming what is eco farming it is a farming uh, it is a farming mutually reinforcing ecological approaches to food production it aims at maintaining of soil chemically biologically and physically the way nature would would do if it is left alone feed the soil not the plant is the watchword or the slogan of ecological farming so basically this is a process in which the soil is best maintained in chemically biologically and physically the way nature wants it okay if you leave the soil alone to the nature to take care of it how would the nature handle its biological uh, chemical and physical characteristics okay so that is the aim of eco farming to achieve that balance so that is why the slogan is feed the soil not the plant okay if you want to grow a particular plant do not try to feed that plant instead feed that soil make that soil nourish and that soil will feed the plant okay so that is the idea behind eco farming now permaculture we are about to end the session okay only a few more slides remaining so what is permaculture basically this is a design system for creating sustainable human environments it uses ecology as the basis for designing integrated systems of food production housing appropriate technology and community development the central theme in permaculture is the design of an ecological landscape that produces food emphasis is placed on multiple use of multi use of plants cultural practices such as sheet mulching and trestling and integration of animals to recycle nutrients and uh, graze uh, weeds so basically this is an umbrella term okay permaculture is a combination of two words permanent and agriculture permanent agriculture it's known as permaculture so if you have to have something permanent then that has to be sustainable correct that has to be holistic correct so designing such a system for sustainable human environments it's known as permaculture it includes everything it includes food production it includes housing it includes appropriate use of technology community development okay so that method is known as permaculture it again promotes organic agriculture which do not use pesticides it aims to maximize symbiotic and synergistic relationships yes if you want a system to function perfectly then obviously there will be plenty of relationships within that system so that's that relationships has to be synergistic or symbiotic it cannot be mutually exclusive or i mean i, I mean it cannot be uh, say uh, mutually uh, you know harmful correct so 
all these has to be taken into account while designing this kind of uh, permaculture it's design specific yeah sorry it's design is site specific client specific and culture specific also important one size fits all policy does not work here why because every ecosystem or every system is different so you have to design that system based on a lot of specificities based on site based on client based on culture based on the type of plant based on uh, the climate etc etc okay another term is integrated farming system what is integrated farming system integration of farm enterprises such as cropping systems animal husbandry fisheries forestry etc etc for optimal utilization of resources bringing prosperity to the farm a farmer can actually combine all these things assume that he is cultivating rice so obviously he have stagnated water you can use that water for fish fish production also correct you you have you are you have to have livestock cattle animals anyway so you can choose to you know start some allied activities uh, with those livestock as well milk production for example correct so by bringing all this together by integrating all this together you are maximizing the agricultural sector the maximizing the output of agricultural sector this is known as integrated farming system okay so what are the benefits obviously all this can be thought of by yourself the benefits of integrated farming system or ifs includes steady income other than income from regular cropping yes correct if you do not get enough income by uh, your main crop from your main crop still you can get income by selling the fish or say you are selling the milk correct then risk coverage due to subsidiary allocation in the event of unexpected crop failures if the crop failed still you have something to you know keep you going correct then employment opportunity yes gives more employment gives more opportunities for employment higher productivity yeah from the same piece of land you are getting more output augmented returns and recycling of organics yes from the cattle the you know uh, the cow dung etc can be used as manure correct these uh, leftover crops can be used as fodder for the cattle so all these are synergistic kind of uh, relationship then easily adopted by marginal and sub marginal farmers you do not have to have acres of land to do this even if your land you have only own a very small piece of land you can bring all these together that general uplift of farm activities better utilization of land labor time and you know available manures so this holistic system is known as integrated farming system now stages of soil erosion okay we only have a couple more slides it's and that is done okay so what are the stages of soil erosion there are four stages splash sheet rill and gully so what is splash it's raining okay it's raining and when the raindrop hits the ground it hits the top soil it will create a splash correct and the top soil will get loosened and it will you know splash to the adjacent region this is known as splash erosion basically it will make the top soil uh you know uh, loose okay and will make it uh, vulnerable for more erosion this is known as splash erosion this is the first stage in the second stage what happens is more and more rainwater comes down which uh, which basically loosens up the top soil to a higher degree and this will create a sheet erosion the entire top soil the thin top soil layer will get eroded along with the rainwater into the adjacent drainage system this is known as sheet erosion this is the second stage third stage rill erosion this is basically a higher amount of soil it's not that thin top soil layer but a thicker layer gets eroded along with water this happens when the soil becomes even more uh, you know uh, uh, diffused with the water not diffused uh, what's the term uh, it will become more uh, you know much much more muddy etc etc okay so that uh, an entire patch of that soil will get eroded in away by the water this is known as rill erosion and after rill erosion you can actually see visible patterns on the land 
you, you, you can actually see that that portion of that soil is gone okay this is known as rill erosion you can see this especially uh, you know uh, in farmlands and all where that entire patch there will be an entire pathing for that water to go this pathing is not created by any particular person and it's not created by farmer or anything the rainwater naturally creates that pathing by eroding away all or the scoring away all those land area all the soil this is known as rill erosion this is the third stage and final stage gully erosion this happens when the rain intensity is very high and you know a huge amount of soil is taken away uh, as a part of this erosion and a gully is generally defined as a scored out area that is not crossable with tillage or grading equipment i mean a huge amount of land is uh, topsoil is gone you can't fill that back with or uh, you know the available extra sand or anything and uh, uh, comparatively a huge area of land is, uh, of topsoil is gone this is the final stage okay so splash sheet rill and gully these are the stages of erosion now some miscellaneous topics the final topic for the day okay so some random terms associated with agriculture uh, what are they in one simple sentence border strip irrigation what is border strip irrigation basically this is an efficient method of irrigation uh, in this method the field is divided by low flat levels into series of strips each of which is flooded separately you might have seen this in somewhere in some pictures at least okay different strips would be there and each strip would have separate uh, watering channels this is known as border strip irrigation allelopathy what is allelopathy it is defined as direct or indirect harmful effect of one plant over the other crop through the exudation of toxic substances from the roots or decomposition of crop residues so there are certain plants which actually secretes toxic substances from their root system these are not in general toxins but these could be toxic for some particular types of plants okay so this effect on the other plant it is known as allelopathy okay now heaving what is heaving injury to plants caused by lifting upward of the plant along with the soil from its normal position in temperate regions where snowfall is common so when snowfall etc happens what happens you know it, it, this doesn't happen in tropical countries like india but in temperate countries during snowfall season the snow will actually you know it will pluck up the land it, it will pluck up the top soil so the plant along with the top soil is being pulled up okay this is known as heaving clear and this is very much dangerous to uh, growing plants cover crops what are cover crops crops which are grown to cover the soil in order to reduce the loss of moisture it's known as cover crops critical stage of irrigation what is critical stage of irrigation the period or the stage of development or of life cycle of the crop when it is most sensitive to moisture stress resulting in yield loss this is known as critical stage of irrigation it is most sensitive to moisture so over irrigation or under irrigation both will cause damage both will cause yield loss that vulnerable period it is known as critical stage of irrigation hard pan what is hard pan i already explained what is hard pan in the previous slide uh, basically it's an impermeable layer of soil formed by accumulation of materials such as salts minerals etc etc heliophytes what is heliophytes what is helio helio means sun fight means phytic means love so plants that love sunlight it's known as heliophytes example rice wheat cotton sugar cane etc etc which means they require intense sunlight to grow skeophytes plants which are shade loving which means they have they need only reduced intensity of light they are known as skeophytes heliotropism what is heliotropism it is the movement of plant towards the sun you have i mean this is very much visible as far as coconut trees are concerned you might have seen certain coconut trees growing like this correct instead of growing straight up these trees will bend and etc etc in a long way why they do this in the search of sunlight because here in the land 
there could be other coconut trees which are preventing sunlight from uh, you know this uh, this tree from getting the sunlight so it will bend towards sunlight this property or uh, this characteristic of plants are known as heliotropism geotropism what is geotropism helio means sun geo means earth correct so a growth movement in response to gravity it is known as geotropism example groundnut peg penetration into the soil the root system penetrates in a particular fashion influenced by the gravity it is known as geotropism last slide hidden hunger what is hidden hunger actually this is a condition it is which, which does not have visual symptoms the plant is obviously lacking nutrients and you can in the eventually in, at the end you will definitely see a yield loss but that plant will not exhibit any symptoms of lacking nutrients this is known as hidden hunger okay now mulching i already explained what mulching is basically you are covering the topsoil with the leftover residues of the previous harvest that is known as mulching basically it helps to reduce soil erosion it helps to reduce transpiration or evaporation uh, of moisture from the topsoil etc etc it will also restrict the weed growth it will maintain the soil temperature it is beneficial for earthworms etc etc very much associated with zero tillage okay last one puddling what is puddling or puddling both way it is the plowing operation carried out in stagnated water conditions to create an impervious layer below the plow pan okay so this is basically a plowing op operation but if the water has to be stagnated then you have to have an impermeable layer correct if otherwise what will happen that water will that water will percolate downwards and it will go to the underground drainage system correct so in order to prevent that you have to have a imperm you have to have an impermeable layer so preparing such a surface is known as puddling you can see this in rice cultivation or any other cultivation where uh, the intensity of water is very very high okay so that is all regarding agriculture please do supplement everything that i have taught you today with current affairs government schemes etc etc all right so uh, that would give you a very good picture of indian agricultural sector and there will there is a small area that deals with geography also that you can study when you study geography based on the soil type you can grow certain plants etc etc okay that deals with that comes under human geography it's a portion of geography you can study it in that perspective all right so that's the end of today's session please make sure to like this video subscribe to my channel and share it with your friends we will meet again tomorrow with another topic and hopefully complete the entire series by 2 3 days okay within this week itself we can finish this and uh, so that you can start your revisions in the new year all right so uh, we did not had a class on uh, christmas so a very belated merry christmas to all of you and uh, yeah i will wish the new year when it comes okay so this is bye bye for today good night see you again tomorrow until then bye